Jala Dane Honashi, Shidu Jerome Viles, Jame Sequeche Dane Nashli, Chan Chief and Dun Sasta, National Breath of Life Archives Development Trainer Nashli. Hi, everybody. I'm Jerome Viles. I'm a Sluts Indian from Oregon. Um, I live in Eugene there and work remotely for the Miyamiya Center for National Breath of Life, and I'm the Archives Development Trainer. Jerome is taller than me, so I, uh, good morning. My name is Gabriela Perez Baez. I have been co-directing the National Breath of Life alongside Daryl for quite some time, um, and so we'll tell you a little bit about what National Breath of Life has been doing since 2010, 2011, but mostly we want to give the floor to five of the apprentices who are working in National Breath of Life uh, at the moment, um, doing uh, archive-based research for the revitalization of their communities' languages. So let me g jump right into that. So the work that we're going to be presenting to you has received uh, support from many different sources, so we want to acknowledge those. Uh, the apprenticeship program that you'll hear about today is funded uh, partly by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, as well as the National Endowment for the Humanities. And past work has been funded also by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Science Foundation for many years. Um, most importantly, none of this would be possible without the sharing will of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, so Mishinewe. Um, there are other institutions that have contributed significantly. Um, of course, the Miami Center, the Miami University, the Smithsonian Institutions, which is where I started uh, my involvement with the National Breath of Life, uh, and the University of Oregon, which is the institution where I uh, work at the moment, um, uh, as well as several archives, the National Anthropological Archives, the National Museum of the American Indian, and the Library of Congress. Um, the mission of the National Breath of Life is to work with language communities to build capacity around methods of archives-based research, specifically for language revitalization purposes. And this is mostly for communities whose languages reach the point of dormancy or near dormancy, and the revitalization is starting from that point onwards. Um, we think about this process in analogy with um, the process of basket weaving, where you have to gather materials, you have to process the materials, and then you have to weave them into a purposeful uh, basket. Um, we started out as a group, the collaboration with um, Daryl and with the Miami Center started out um, in the gathering uh, process, or the, the phase, so where uh, community members um, are facilitated through the process of getting to the archival materials, and that's where the partnerships with the various archives emerged. Um, but that takes a certain amount of time, and once there's enough materials, in, uh, archival materials in the community, those materials need to be processed. And that, pro that process is really um, protracted and very complex and requires a lot of attention to detail. Um, at the time uh, when the Miami Center had developed the Miami uh, Illinois Digital Archive, it became very clear two things, that the community archivists who we were interacting with were coming into Breath of Life with much more uh, developed skill sets and also that they were reaching that point where they had too many materials and not a good method to process them. So if you think about coming to the archives and being presented with 30, 40, 50 boxes of archival materials, analog, you know, pencil on, on paper, uh, where do you start? How do you keep track of that work? Um, so the, uh, very graciously, the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma shared the technology of MIDA, and we turned it into what is now the Indigenous Languages Digital Archive in collaboration with uh, Jerome and his brother Carson Viles, uh, as well as JC Hall, who were working on uh, archives-based research for the revitalization of Nuea. Uh, fast forward to today. 
Uh, we have um, software that we're able to offer to communities. We can provide the training, and that's uh, Jerome's uh, focus. And we are, uh, at the moment, in this smack in the middle of the processing phase, uh, providing a framework and support for community researchers to take the time to do that very uh, uh, detail-oriented uh, process. Moving forward, we will be developing uh, a module three approach to weaving, and we're actually already engaged in discussions with the apprentices um, to learn from them, um, Nepondingi, right? To learn from them about what that phase will look like. But for now, we will focus on what this apprenticeship has been. Uh, Jerome will tell you a few words about that. Yes, so, <clears throat> uh oh. <laughs> so, um, we had been running workshops every couple of years for folks, and they lasted two weeks or a week long, and we really realized that communities need um, longer term engagement in partnership with us. So, we, in 2021, moved to a model where we provide direct support in, in terms of funding and ongoing training to um, 12 apprentices from 10 communities around the country. They've worked on a variety of projects, um, both archival and dictionary based. Everyone comes into this work at very different places um, in that process. Um, and so they've all been working on some aspect of building a digital archive using ILDA or building a dictionary or doing really hardcore transcription projects of their archival materials. We're nearing the end of that program right now. We um, wrap up our, our pilot apprenticeship um, this fall. And one thing we've struggled a little bit with not having in-person gathering, in-person workshops, is that everyone is um, working on their own. I get to talk to everyone, but they don't talk to each other. So we've taken the opportunity this week to bring everyone together, um, be together for a couple days before the Miyamiaki conference, and then let everyone attend this together. So it's been a really great experience getting to know all of our apprentices. I just want to tell them how wonderful and inspiring they are to me as someone who does this work. Um, much like I get inspired by the, the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma's work, I'm inspired by all of these people too and feel so privileged to work with all of you. Um, I think we've talked enough, so we'll uh, start asking our apprentices questions and spend the rest of the time I'm just having a conversation. Um, I think first off, we will just ask folks to introduce yourselves, um, say where you're from, your community, and just tell a little bit about your uh, community's language revitalization context. Shayla, shoot hagi a, Bo Johnson wa am nashi, selects tribal member nashli, selects then sasta hi chu. So I work on the same language as Jerome. Um, we're, it's from Southern Oregon, and uh, we were removed up north to uh, Siletz, Oregon, where, uh, where I live now. Marawaika, nanani at sa Cape Piwinaf Cape Briner, nase namawaiipa koe ma ada naisha dene, nase dotin naita. Uh, my name is Kate Pewinovka Briner. I'm Kiowa, Comanche, and Apache. Uh, I currently work on Comanche language, uh, but also support Apache and uh, Kiowa as well. And we are in the situation where we have about approximately five first language speakers um, and about 20 people who can hold a conversation, sustain conversation. And so this work uh, allows us to move the pendulum the other way, and we've already seen the impacts of that. So, Eda. Tak. Tai estas. Luis and Kishluami, Jamie Lentanas, Nakukwisma, Hannes Nach Tlis. Uh, hey everybody, good to see you. Um, my name is Jamie, I'm a Coos person. My heritage language is Hannes Coos. 
Um, but our community has uh, three languages, Milikus, Haneskus, and Shayushtla uh, Ulkuyich, a language shared by two ethnic groups. Uh, so, so the name is long. Um, our languages have been dormant since the 60s or 70s. Yam ketame netwanya ne sitla liarvisu no neha tongvetam pipimarom koi kumiai koi nawa nehinkem ha huyuna e kime hurupave koi hotukna. My name is Sitla Liarvisu and I'm from uh, the Gabrielino Tongva and the Genyo Kumiai and Nawa people. Uh, my ancestor is Huyanat, and then my people come from the village of Hurupanga and Hotukna. Um, the Gabrielino Tongva are the indigenous people of the Los Angeles Basin, and our territory includes uh, three counties and the four southern channel islands, all of the Los Angeles Basin. Uh, we haven't had a speaker for many, many years, and so we're in the process of reawakening our language. Thank you. Oise wapeni Terry Hinesley nitai kopi wapa komisi no no chipia no ki saniti eko niteta sawan wanila. My name is Terry Hinesley. I'm tribal member of the Shawnee tribe, and our um, oh, of course we're uh, located in uh, in Oklahoma currently, but we have uh, tribal members all across the nation, and our language program is. Uh, we're currently offering classes um, remotely. So that allows our, our language to get back into uh, the mouths of our people who are all across the, uh, the country. And this work that we're doing here with the National Breath of Life is allowing us to create our archives and an online database that's accessible to all of our students and citizens. And it's, uh, it's really crucial in, in supporting the work that we're doing. Um, when I talk, I don't remember what I said, so I'm not sure if I mentioned, but our, our program is open to all three of our, our tribes. They're open to Shawnee tribal citizens, Eastern Shawnee, as well as absentee, and we have students from all three of those. So um, I'm, I'm really excited for our, our program and then uh, our internship or apprenticeship here with Breath of Life. Anyway. Thank you. Um, and maybe we can then backtrack and start with Terry and ask you what kinds of language materials are available to your community um, and what has your apprenticeship, uh, apprenticeship focused on? What has been the process? What is your support team like? So we'll start with Terry. I should have wrote all those down so I can remember what she asked. <laughs> um, as far as our language materials go, um, of course, we, we have access to quite a few um, documents and dictionaries that have been created over the time. Um, we have first-person material that's been created from speakers over the years. Um, we've had different, I guess, um, reiterations, if that's the right word, of our language program. We, we've had many different ones with the different people providing material and instructing. Uh, we have access to those materials. We have um, current uh, first language speaker who is helping us and providing material. Uh, we're constantly um, getting more material for our program from him. Um, I'm so sorry, I can't remember all your questions. I think the next part was, uh, what has your apprenticeship project focused on so far? So for myself, the, the primary portion of, of the, uh, the apprenticeship is focused on dictionary creation and building. Uh, we have done quite a bit of work in, in building archives. So we have a lot of our material that's been transcribed and put into the uh, ILDA archive database. However, what I do myself is, is primarily dictionary creation. So 
we're taking curriculum from from our classes we're inputting uh, vocabulary and language from that and putting it into our dictionary we're looking at everyday situations things that people would say in their their daily life putting that into our dictionary expanding out into different type of concepts that people are thinking about that they they might want to um, be able to reference but hasn't been used in classes yet and we're also working on putting all of our our different versions of previous dictionaries into it as well it's all a quite a big process so we're we're focusing primarily on classroom content but i'm also able to work on sliding in a lot of this other material that had been previously documented so my goal is to have at some point everything that we have access to in the dictionary so it's going to be a a constantly evolving dictionary. I don't think it, in my opinion, it should never be finished. We, we may at some point get through all the material, but there's, while we still have speakers, there, there's always more to, uh, to contribute with. And was there one more question? Yeah, perhaps just understanding what the support team is. So who, oh, yeah. Are, yeah. So our, our support team, um, we, we have our National Breath of Life support team, uh, primarily for myself, it's Jerome Viles over there, uh, providing guidance on how to navigate and, and work with the software. Um, they also have uh, a tech team that, that's very helpful in um, being able to help tweak the, the software for our needs. And then, also, our, our language program, we have, that, that's my support team as well. We have our, our uh, director of our program, Joel Barnes. We have um, our linguist, Anastasia um, Miller Yost. Uh, we have another linguist working with this, Carl Schaefer. He's been very instrumental in um, helping with the archive portion of ILDA. And then, of course, I'd say most importantly, we have our fluent speaker, which is George Blanchard. And we also have quite a few other people on our language team that um, is always around to help support. Thanks, Terry. And <laughs> taking in everything he said. Um, well, our. For my tribe, um, we're, I'm focusing right now on materials from John P. Harrington Reels. I'm, I'm, I'm putting into the archive, the ILDA database, um, the materials that, which no one has done, no one has processed. Um, there's several Reels that include hundreds of pages of documentation, and I'm trying to process all of that, which is giving us a better understanding of um, and helping us uh, format our curriculum. We have a curriculum uh, and a dictionary already, but nothing is digitized by any means. Um, also, it's very helpful for our community because uh, there is a there has been a longstanding concept in, amongst our community. There was a big um, intimidation about the institutions that held the the data the the, tran the actual archives and so a lot of our community did not feel they could access that material and so um, that's changed for us and so right now my team or my support includes we have a language committee and a couple of dozen people that really um, give a lot of input into anything I have questions about or any decisions that need to be made. Um, they've, we've created a modern orthography, so most of my work sur is surrounding transcribing everything into our modern orthography. And we also, um, I usually meet once a week with our, with the linguist, um, Pamela Monroe, and our, there's about a handful of elders from my community that 
if I have questions about, sometimes the linguist and I don't see eye to eye about a lot of things, and so I have to go to my community and, and talk to them about it and then circle back around, but that's the majority of my work right now. Thank you. Okay. I realized after I passed the mic that uh, I, I said I was coos, like we're a big famous nation or something, but um, we... <laughs> Uh, I'm a member of the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Seusla Indians, and we're, we're based on the Central Oregon coast. <laughs> um, so uh, our team is, um, I'm the apprentice, and then we have two, excuse me, wow, you really have to be close to this thing. Okay, we have two uh, linguists in our tribe, uh, Patty Whereat Phillips and Anna Helms, and um, then there are a couple of uh, academic linguists in Oregon that have worked on our languages um, and have worked with us, uh, have supported our educational and archival um, efforts. Um, and so before the, before the apprenticeship started, um, our linguists had done the, uh, you know, gathering materials from, from different institutions and uh, had begun the process of, um, uh, transcribing a lot of those materials. My apprenticeship has focused on uh, carrying forward the work of transcription. Uh, I've been doing it for like two years now, and almost all of that time has been uh, dedicated to transcription. Um, we have... Uh, you know, we have records of uh, songs and stories and things that are, are kind of um, less central to, you know, the, the word lists and, and that kind of stuff is, is for the most part fully transcribed at this point. Uh, so my work has kind of shifted into um, trying to make the data more useful to us in the in the future. Uh, we put off including uh, modern orthography, we, we call ours our, our learner's orthography. Uh, we put off including that in the spreadsheets because uh, we were still developing the orthography, um, but we feel pretty settled on our system for the time being at least. Uh, so my latest project has been going back through all of the spreadsheets uh, that I've transcribed over, <laughs> over literal years and adding um, the, the modern writing forms, um, which I, which will be great because it, it'll expand, you know, even if it's just removing an accent on, on three vowels or something, uh, it just makes it that much more approachable and usable uh, for learners. So it's not just a tool for uh, academics and teachers. Hopefully uh, learners will be able to make use of it as well. All right. So um, for Comanche, uh, we've had, gosh, I'm apprentice number four, I think. Um, so we had some some change, uh, and then I was kind of mentoring our apprentices along with Jerome. And so with the political issues that we've had in the last year, uh, we have taken our nonprofit, which is the Comanche Language and Cultural Preservation Committee, outside the tribe again, uh, which has been doing the work since 1993. Um, and so we're in a unique position where we have almost way too much stuff. Um, our elders had been recording everything that they did as they created our dictionary. So we have like 10 and 12 speakers talking about the language on a video. We have videos that they made for the home, videos they made for preschool. We have, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of hours of audio that they had done. Uh, we have stuff uh, all over the country. <laughs> um, so what kind of what I'm doing is I kind of think of it as like a second gathering process and kind of going through what we have, um, digitizing things, because if you if you don't know that CDs and DVDs have a shelf life and we've come to the end because in, the, in 25 years ago, the process for digitization was put it on a CD. And so we're coming to the end of the life, sh the shelf life of those items. And so it's kind of a race to to digitize that material. Um, and we already have things that will not um, digitize. So we'll have to find those uh, original sources again. So I've been going through that, um, going over the, the previous apprentices work, um, double checking things. Um, we had a 5,500 word list that the elders made for the language committee as a dictionary and so we were able to put that into the dictionary and I'm so I, I my stuff is really uh, student driven what they want to see right now and so going back through the dictionary and doing the high frequency words first 
Um, in on the archive side, we've been putting things like hymns in songs that people want to learn, and they can go in there and learn it line by line. And then uh, our charter school. So we have things like the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and we're the first tribally sponsored charter school in the nation. And uh, we're required to say the Pledge of Allegiance once a week per state law, but the state law does not determine which language we can say it in. So the very first thing I ever put into the archive side was the Pledge of Allegiance. And um, our kids sound like first language speakers when they visit, they've been visiting with Morrison Tomacare in the archive. So, um, and my support team is really uh, awesome. I, you know, Jerome and the National Breath of Life team is wonderful. And then um, we have a really wonderful core group of people in Comanche Nation that support this work and come in and volunteer and even do citizen transcriptions. So uh, I think that's it. Um, as far as resources, uh, we're lucky enough that uh, we're working on a northern dialect of our language. And so we, we already have a lot of work done on the southern dialect, and we can kind of bounce off of that. Um, the <clears throat> Talwas down there in Northern California um, you know, have a fluent speaker and a, a family that uh, uh, speaks really strongly. And so we can bounce ideas off of them. Um, you know, we're sister tribes and we have the same worldview and the same dances and stuff like that. And so the way we um, make sounds in the language, you know, the words might be a little different, but we conjugate our verbs the same and we put together our sentences the same. So um, that's really helpful working in the Northern dialect. And then uh, for me, I'm kind of in a unique situation where I'm lucky enough to where the fellow that runs the apprentices, you know, works on the same language as me and uh, lives close enough that, you know, when I get confused, you know, they're, they're talking about working from home and being kind of, you know, lonely work and it's um, overwhelming. I'll, I'll get overwhelmed and I'll just drive over, you know, <laughs> hour and a half or whatever and sit down with them and he uh, lets me come in into his house and uh, speak with his, his kid and his family, and so I'm lucky that way. Well, thank you all for that. Um, we're blowing through time. I think we'll just ask you all one more question, and you can kind of popcorn this one, whoever wants to answer. Um, but we're just wondering if you could uh, talk about a couple highlights of the work. So you've all been doing it a couple years. Is it... You know, something you found in archival materials, an experience you had with somebody, sharing something, just any aspect of the work that's like a, a highlight to you in the last couple of years. Um, for me, it's just like, it kind of brings me back to why I started learning language. Um, you know, the first time I, I go to ceremony and, uh, um, dancing and we have those prayers in between our songs and I just had uh, my first time dancing was such a uh, strong experience for me and then you know I wanted to know what those prayers are talking about and I want to know not just how to translate them but what you know why they're being said and the deeper meaning there so um, working on the language for a few years you slowly pick stuff up and you know, you know you're getting better, but sometimes you don't realize. And then uh, after COVID, because we, we didn't dance for two or three years there, and then uh, just going back and being able to kind of uh, understand some of that was big for me. Um, I think for me, it's with the, the issue of audio and video, um, I, I can be going somewhere like to a powwow or going to see the kids at the school um, and somebody will stop me on the street even if they don't, like I don't know who they are and they'll say, hey, I go to the dictionary every day to hear my grandma's voice. I go and I tell all my family and I share it and we all do that and so the fact that people are finding a connection and visiting with people who aren't here anymore I think is the very definition of that connection 
Um, I also think we have Comanche 4Rs, which is reciprocity, relationship, redistribution, and uh, respect. And uh, the highlight for me is to see uh, the Miamia people embody that in what they do. Um, and it's a standard that I now have for what I want to see in my community. So uh, for that. Yeah, um, a lot of highlights. <laughs> it's it's work I'm really passionate about. Um, I, I think uh, a couple things I want to I want to mention are um, working with the archives for me has been uh, really meaningful in terms of a exposure to uh, kind of a historical culture, um, and and just kind of get, getting a, a, a small flawed lens into uh, a worldview that uh, has changed a lot. Um, that that has that has really meant a lot to me. Um, uh, the intertribal uh, cooperation has been another big one. Uh, you know, we have uh, people, uh, heritage uh, speakers and learners of different languages in different, you know, tribes in Oregon, and so um, as well as closely related languages across uh, across tribal lines. So uh, collaborating on on education and the archival work uh, has has been uh, really great. Com coming together on language work and, and seeing that that's something. Think that that's something that uh, that people really care about. That that's been great. Um, yeah, that's all I'll mention for now. Um, I think a couple of highlights for me um, have been just very personally the the speaker whose documentation I'm working on, Jose de los Santos Juncos, also known as Quinn. Um, he reminds me a lot of my male relatives, and it's just very interesting. I feel very connected with him as a speaker, so going through um, the documentation is, um, there's a lot of times that I kind of get like very connected and, and feel like he's there, so that's a very special, um, I think it's a very special thing. I don't really know. I think there's the only ones that can really understand that for me. But um, the other thing that's been very uh, important for my community is that we've been able to, we're a densely populated area, they're very urban. Um, our land does not look the way it used to, but um, because of that, a lot of our springs, which were very, very important, our natural springs um, have dried up and um, our rivers are cemented. So. Um, we've been able to identify a lot more of the locations of where those springs have been through the documentation. And also, um, we've been able to add and confirm. Uh, we, we knew of these villages, but now we have additional confirmation of about uh, 25 more villages. So that's been something that's really important for us as a community. For me, <coughs> sorry. For me, I'd say um, there's two highlights that I'll, I'll talk about. For The first one is personal, being able to be immersed in the language and be able to kind of, from, from the dictionary building, dealing with so many aspects of words and then trying to think of connected words to enter into the dictionary. You really get to see how the words mean what they mean. You get to see the building blocks of it. and. Uh, just to see how the structure of our, our languages has, has been, it's been very, um, I can't find the word, so I'll say good. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's been very meaningful. But then the, the other highlight that, that I'll talk about is being able to see our, our students and then other community members who are accessing the dictionary being able to see them have access to the language beyond um, that, that, that they can get kind of on their own in conjunction with speaking with people and, and teachers and students and classmates, being able to see their personal growth that's available and see them actually using it and then getting to understand it as well. That's, that's, been, that's been a really key um, takeaway from it. It's, um, it's pretty amazing, and I, I'm excited to see 
uh, much more language growth within our communities. Well, thank you so much for sharing each of you. Um, you know, I get to hear your stories and see your work all the time, and it um, I have so much pride to be able to share that with you, just so blessed to be able to share that with you, and really happy to see you share it with other people, too. It's really amazing work that you're doing. Um, just want to say thank you, Mission Awe, to the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma, all of you um, here. You know, you're supporting this work through the Miamia Center, um, and it's that's a huge thing. Um, you know, we talk about the tribal, uh, the tribe university partnership being unique. Um, I think a tribe supporting this sort of national effort is also unique. Um, and just really want to, we raise our hands in the Northwest to say thank you. Um, but big mission anyway, we're really thankful to be here sharing with you this weekend.